Its terrain covers more than 60,000 glorious acres of Western Scotland and includes large parts of the ruggedly beautiful island of Tyree. For centuries, its grand seat, Inverara Castle, has housed the chieftain of one of the world's best-known family clans, the Clan Campbell. For more than 500 years, the castle has stood proud on the western shore of Loch Fyne, Scotland's longest saltwater sea log. It is now the home to the 13th Duke of Argyll, His Grace Torquil Ian Campbell. Thank you very well, I'm, much. I'm, and... I'm the clan chief. Oh, well, nice um, to meet you. Oh, my goodness, the Duke. <laughs> His wife, Eleanor, whose family owned the Cadbury's chocolate empire, <laughs> and their three children. Running an estate of this size in the 21st century is a far cry from times gone by. Today's been good. It's been very busy, hasn't it? She had the cruise ships, we had lots of tourists. It's been busy. And, of course, the large amount of Campbells as well. It represents a daily challenge for a young couple who work around the clock to maintain a proud tradition that stretches back for centuries. Actually taking this place on was just something that I'd prepared myself for all my life. And yet, the grand fortress so very nearly came to a premature end when calamitous misfortune struck in 1975. I was here with my mother, it was mid-afternoon, and there I was standing watching the bonfire. But nobody else was watching the bonfire, they were all watching the castle burn down. And that, to me, is a, something that I will never, ever forget. The shore of beautiful Loch Fyne has hosted an Inverara castle since the 15th century. The castle that is today the spiritual home to Campbells across the globe took 43 years to build. The present Duke and his family occupy two floors. The rest of the castle is open to paying customers, many of them Campbells from all over the world, who come to see how the clan chieftains of one of Scotland's most powerful families once lived and how the present chieftain lives now. Over a checkered history straddling hundreds of years, Campbells have led the nation and have fought and died in both sides of attritional wars. Today, weapons used in these wars adorn the walls of the castle's great hall. Under the tallest ceiling in Scotland are over 1,800 examples of arms, and armory through the ages. Halberds, pistols, shields, and muskets. My mother was very keen on black powder muzzle firing weapons. And uh, we actually restored quite a few of them to firing order. And we used to fire them as, as uh, and, you know, younger children, which was quite impressive because, you know, you pull the trigger and there's a sort of big puff of smoke and then a bang and, and off goes the musket ball. But um, as children, we used to sit there in the evenings and, and melt lead and pour them in and make musket balls here. I come from a good Quaker family, so actually we don't even... Uh, when, whenever there's been a war, then we've been the ones driving the ambulances or, or that kind of thing. So actually not even soldiers, not a family of soldiers at all. The family traditionally supported the, the British Crown, uh, but the eighth Earl uh, fell out of favour with King Charles I. Uh, he was a very strong Presbyterian and he lost his head. Uh, then his son, the ninth Earl, restored the good name of the family, uh, but he fell out of favour with uh, King James VII, and he lost his head as well. Now, we have here, in this particular showcase, the Bible that he had in his prison cell the night before he was executed. And what makes it particularly gory is he's actually marked the Bible in his own personal blood uh, of the various chapters he wanted people to read. He was beheaded uh, in Edinburgh in uh, 1685 by the Maiden, which was the Scottish guillotine. Now, in those days, you know, the Scots were pretty brutal. Uh, with a guillotine, the blade comes down on the back of your head uh, as you're facing down, but with the Maiden, you have to face up and the blade comes down your throat. So you can actually see as it comes down, but uh, I've no intention of being taken by the Maiden. There's two very, uh, very strong traits or genetic traits that run in the family. One is the nose and the other is squint eyes. 
Uh, and if you look at a couple of the portraits, you see the same thing. And I have to say, I carry on the same trait. Didn't put me off, but we've just spent a lot of time having the elder son's eyes done because the teacher at school said, did you realise we think he might have slightly squint eyes? Yes. So, yes, a lot of testing goes on. But these days it's quite fixable, luckily. The first stone of what was to become the fabulous Inverara Castle was laid in 1746. Even as the dying fires of the Jacobite rebellions were finally snuffed out, at the Battle of Culloden. This new era in Scottish history meant that for the first time, Scottish castles were being designed, not as fearsome fortresses, but as showcases of their owners' extravagant wealth and hospitality. In its heyday, Inverara Castle employed over 60 servants. Today, there are four full-time employees and 21 part-time staff members. Being a duke, is an hereditary title that is passed down from father to son. But how exactly does one become a duchess? I was a friend of Tocqueville's sisters. I was in the car with Louise, my now sister-in-law, and we were driving past, and I said, wow, look at that, look at that out the window. She said, that's where we're going. And I could sort of hear my mother's voice in the back of my head going, you should have done your search, you should have you realised who you're going to stay with, and I just thought I was going to stay with Louise. I met Tocqueville when I was 19, and very glad I didn't marry him then. So 13 years later, we finally got married. And this is my wedding dress, which uh, I wore on the 8th of June, 11 years ago. Uh, it was designed by Bruce Oldfield, and it was amazing. It was, uh, it was stunning. It was a very beautiful coat for the day. And then in the evening, the coat came off, and there was a very elegant party dress underneath. So I was a lucky girl. Poor dad. <laughs> I never assumed I'd marry anyone in particular, and was a little surprised myself when I ended up with this place to look after. Today, all hands are on deck as the Duke and Duchess are expecting over a thousand visitors to the castle. Over the years, the castle has played backdrop to events as varied as they are numerous. Today is the turn of the International Vintage Automobile Club. Members pay up to £2,000 to take part in the rally. This year, the tour takes in Scotland, and today's much-anticipated stop is at Inverara Castle, where they are to be greeted personally by the Duke of Argyle. And the Duke. This is, this is my castle you come to today. Australia, Melbourne, Australia. We shipped the car to London via, on a, in a container, and then we've driven up from London for the rally specially. I think it's great. I'm not too sure how we're going to manage to fit all 250 cars in, but so far looking good. And the weather's still dry as well, which helps. But no, I mean, it's great to see. I mean, you're driving along the roads in Argyle today and you see all this lot coming towards you, you think, crikey, you know, what's, going, what's going on? Have you had a good, you had a good drive so far? So far, oh, yeah. I'd say it's amazing to yeah. see quite so many of these cars all together. It's extraordinary. Yeah. But you brought it all the way over from the States? Great. You San have? Diego. You have, from San Diego. Brilliant, amazing. What a bit of a, bit of a, bit of a road trip. Well, it's a boat trip, <laughs> or an airplane trip, and uh, then some rain. Oh, well, then. We actually had a day and a half of nice weather. Most cars have got two people in them, so that's, you know, that's another 500, you know, 500 people here. And that's 500 people who need to be fed and watered in the castle tea room and who will also be paying to be shown around the house in the company of head guide Stafford Day. I think people come here for a day out for a bit of fun, uh, a little bit of education, but mostly fun. And so they're usually in a happy mood when they arrive, and I like to hope they're even happier when they leave. The guests receive a traditional Scottish welcome from Inverara Castle's resident piper, Ian Campbell whom eagle-eyed fans of a certain award-winning television series might recognise. He's actually a, re he's a really nice piper. He's, uh, I hasten to add, he's a Campbell as well. And uh, him and his brother played at uh, My Wife and My Wedding. He was also the piper on Downton Abbey. 
Oh, it was brilliant. We were so lucky because Downton's such a massive, massive thing at the moment. And they, we heard that they wanted to film in Scotland or Ireland. I think they were looking at somewhere more rugged. They wanted to go somewhere for their, for their shooting, sort of, you know, stalking, fishing, for their, for their autumn break. So we were very lucky. They said to us, have you got a castle? Have you got a typically Scottish sort of, you know, deer, river, mountains, water? And we kept saying, yeah, yes, we've got all that. So they came up to do a recce and they wanted to see deer and they were sitting there with their film crews and just apparently deer were walking past the camera, practically waving, sort of coming past. So we were very lucky and there were amazing rainbows that day. And so yes, it was brilliant and then we got chosen, which was really, really exciting. The title of Duke of Argyle, along with its many responsibilities, including those of clan chieftain of Campbells worldwide, is handed down through the male line of the family. The present Duke took over the running of the estate 11 years ago. Actually taking this place on was just something that I'd prepared myself for all my life. You know, I'd been to school, I went to the Royal Agricultural College at Cirencester, and I was the first person of the family to actually go and learn or study how to, to, to run a rural estate. Uh, whereas in previous generations, they all joined the army. So, you know, when I said to my father, that no, I didn't want to join the army because I wasn't very good at taking orders from other people. Uh, he was actually very disappointed. Yeah. The every generation does it their own way. Um, my parents did it in a very different way to the way that we're doing it. In today's situation, today's environment, I think you know it's got to be run as a business. It's got to work for itself. But I do it because I am very passionate. Uh, about the family, about the castle, about trying to maintain this amazing heritage that we have. To me, it's, um, I would say, it's more of a responsibility uh, rather than a duty. As the Austin Healy's make their way out of Inverera, the Duke and his estate manager, Andrew Montgomery, hurry in the opposite direction. A neighbor's sheep are destroying newly planted trees on estate lands. The hungry animals have already cost the Duke thousands of pounds, and if they're not stopped quickly, the damage could run into the hundreds of thousands. Not only have we got deer to contend with and ticks to contend with and uh, uh, you know, weevils to contend with and all sorts of things, we've now got our neighbour's sheep to contend with. We've got stalkers who can shoot the deer. However, we can't go and shoot our neighbour's sheep. It is uh, against the law to do that. So um, I'm in a catch-22 situation um, whereby I'm trying to be neighbourly, but there is a limit. My wife and Andrew have a little bit of a laugh sometimes together because they both say that they started on the job at the same time. Did very well that year. <laughs> Bumper year. Andrew is responsible for the Duke of Argyle's vast land holdings that stretch across the west coast of Scotland. He joined forces with the Duke 11 years ago, having previously managed the estates of Blenheim Palace, birthplace of Sir Winston Churchill. It's just myself and the Duke, and um, you know, for us it works brilliantly well like that, and uh, we have a good relationship with each other. I think he trusts me to get on with things. You know, I look after the legal side, I do all of the agreements. I don't have a financial controller, I don't have a property director, I don't have this, I don't have that. That's me. Um, so, but but within, within the estate, I think we have up to 10 different businesses, including the castle and, and, and you know, renewables businesses, property development businesses. So it's all happening um, and such a lot going on. And of course it's vast. So I could be here one day, I could be in, on the Isle of Tyree the next day, I could be on Mull the next day. It's, I try and spread myself as, as thinly as I can, but there's a limit. One of the very sort of positive aspects of the estate here is that we're a very, very diverse estate. Um, the bit that people see is the tourism part of it. It's the castle, it's, it's the visitors. And my wife and I probably spend a disproportionately large amount of time making sure that's right, because that's the impression that everybody gets. That's what people see. 
but behind that, uh, you know, there is a huge business that people don't see, which is forestry, agriculture, um, hydropower, wind power, biofuels, uh, minerals, uh, commercial property, residential property, sporting, so shooting and fishing. Uh, and that is very important as well because, you know, it all, it all keeps the whole thing rolling. This site has all been replanted. They're coming over the hill and they're just working their way through the plantation, take, pulling out the trees. So they just, they just pull it out, take a bite of it and move on to the next one? Yeah, exactly. And, and they're working their way across and, and, and onto this side also, as you can see on this side. One of our golden eagles. Yeah, I see it, just above the wood. This is the problem, as you can see. Um, that's supposed to be growing in the ground. Sheep come along and they, unlike deer, deer a deer will n nip the top off and then they'll nip this piece and then nip this piece and they'll, they'll just strip the side, but you've got something, still something growing, which will grow again from the, from the bottom or the, or the side. But Mr. Sheep comes along and he pulls it out and pulls it right out of the ground. And then we're left with that lying on the, on the ground, which of course, when these roots dry out, is, is, is dead, useless. I mean, that's, how much is that a tree? Well, that's a pound, uh, over a pound, pound 40 to, to put into the ground. And, and you know, it's, um, you multiply that, so you only need a, there's two there, you only need a hundred of those, and it's a couple of hundred pounds, and then multiply that by the, the site. You know, it, it gets into thousands of pounds very quickly. So if we don't do anything about this, if we don't replant, then we'll have our grant taken away by the Forestry Commission. And that's why on Sunday morning, when I could have been doing something better, I was having a discussion with my neighbour about her sheep. Um, you know, they, they, they know it's they know the problem, and, and if it was the other way around, then I'm sure they'd be shouting down the phone to me. While the Duke keeps busy with the estate, the Duchess immerses herself in a relatively new undertaking. Last year, Eleanor organised the inaugural Best of the West Festival. It's that time again, and back at the castle, she has invited a team made up of people from the town for a meeting to discuss this year's upcoming event. We'll get that off as well because they're the But our lineup's well amazing. We've got the Red Hot Chili Pipers, yeah. Scary Wolf, Skitnish, Inverell Pipe Band, yeah. new talent up and coming, the Mighty Caymans, mm -hmm. complete mixture. Yeah. It's brilliant. Yeah. We realised we were sitting on this amazing, amazing pocket of really good food and really good music and really good whatever. So. I'm very lucky we've got very talented people around here, so we bring everyone in together. And we've set up an amazing weekend, I hope, for anyone who, who can make it here. So last year we had 5,000 people who came mainly from the top half of England and Scotland, all across Scotland, and then quite a few overseas visitors to, to celebrate what's great around here. Sponsorship. Have we got any update on that? Uh, Caledonia Brain, I need to chase as well. And I've had an email from Shivers Brothers saying they're very interested, but I haven't heard any more, so fingers crossed. We've got amazing uh, seafood, we've got amazing lamb, we've got mull cheddars, we've got uh, smoked salmon and oysters from uh, literally Tainalt, which is half an hour down the road. And amazing music. Uh, within an hour of, of here, we have all sorts of talent that's, that is great to use. I want to get people to come here, even if they're not interested in the history side of it. If they can come here for a family weekend, they might think, wow, you know, this is a great place, I'd like to come back here. <laughs> It's the end of a busy day in the life of the Duke and Duchess. And with the River Era flowing at the bottom of the garden, the Duke likes nothing better than a spot of fishing. I'm so lucky because the river's at the bottom of the garden. I can pop out for 20 minutes, half an hour. It's not a sort of full day excursion. So any opportunity I get, I'm usually found down on the river. Hey, it's very early in the year. And I could tell you that I caught a really big one yesterday, but uh, actually I'm just dusted off my rod for the first time this season. Even in his downtime, the well-being of the estate is always on the Duke's mind. The most important thing for me and my wife is that, you know, the people that actually come, they go home with amazingly good memories. They tell their friends and, you know, they encourage other people to come back. I want, you know, I want the experience to be the best it possibly can, or the best I can possibly offer. You never get it perfect and you can always make it better. So it's always a challenge. This is the River Era. So this is where the village get, or the town gets its name from, and also the castle, Inver Era Castle. So Inver is Gaelic for the mouth of, and the Era is the name of the river. Amazing wildlife. You've got the sound of the water and the birds. My mother was the sort of outdoor character of the family, and now I'm taking my children. 
and they don't really have the patience for it yet. Now they come down here, they want to catch something instantaneously. You know, fishing's all about you might catch something. There's nothing better than fresh fish. You know, you catch it, you know, it can be on your plate in half an hour. But generally speaking, we put them back. Um, because, you know, these sort of wild fish, wild salmon, wild sea trout, are actually quite, quite rare these days. Now, out of the long list of titles that I've got, the only one that can't be taken away is McKaylan Moore, which is chief of Clan Campbell. And that, of course, is, you know, a blood title. And, you know, that just happens to be who I am. So quite a big responsibility. You know, it's a big global family. Uh, one of the biggest Scottish names. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm the clan chief. You scared them all away. You would think that being the 13th Duke of Argyll, Marquis of Kintyre and Lorne, Earl of Argyll, Campbell and Cowell, Viscount Rock Orr and Glen Isla, Lord Campbell of Lorne, Kintyre, Inverera, Mull, Morven and Tyree would be pretty much a full-time job. But the Duke of Argyll has one other title to add to the list. He is also International Ambassador for Royal Salute Whiskey, made by Shivers Brothers. The Royal Salute Distillery is a four-hour drive away in the Highland village of Keith. I travel the world, I promote the brand. I am Scottish, born and bred. Scotland is in my blood. And, you know, every Scotsman that I know is passionate about what is, you know, arguably the number one export from the Scottish mainland, excluding oil. Uh, and whiskey's in my blood, it's in my family. Today, the Duke is meeting up with Colin Scott, Shivers Brothers Master Blender. Colin is the custodian of the signature Shivers Regal brand and the only person in the world who knows what goes into the famous blends. 1973. Wow. So this has been sitting here for about 40 years, and each year we lose about 2% per annum, which as the cast breeze, this nice cool air, the whiskey matures, and so every year we lose about 2%, so 80% has gone out of this cask already, but that leaves beautiful, rich, intense whiskey. Yeah, so, so what's gone is the angel, angel shack. The angels, just enjoying life in this warehouse. Wouldn't mind being the angel above that one. <laughs> and then the really special ones in the vault. Absolutely, very special. Well, this is the most expensive bottle of blended Scotch whiskey in the world and it is Royal Salute Tribute to Honour. The presentation was actually done by Garrards of London, the Crown Jewellers. Uh, the flagon itself is made of the finest white New Zealand porcelain. Uh, and as you can see, quite a lot of gold, silver. It's got a total of 413 black and white diamonds on it, weighing a total of 23 carats. And most importantly, the contents in the inside is a 45-year-old blended Royal Salute. Uh, there are 21 bottles made, and it uh, sells for just over 200,000 US dollars a bottle. That's probably it. That comes out here. Okay. Always nice to wash the cask. But of course, this is natural strength. Look at the colour, look at the colour. Well, about 55% alcohol Amazing. and natural colour. There we go. Oh, don't want to spill any more of it. Ooh. There we go. Look One down. That. One for you, of course. Thank you very much. With the greatest of pleasure. Look at Shall I just make mine a little bit bigger? Absolutely. Your health. And yours too, Colin. Very slange of all. In 1744, the town of Inverera was little more than a huddle of humble cottages sitting in the grounds of the castle. Having the town on his doorstep was far from ideal in the new age of prestigious visitors to the aristocratic seat. And so, the fifth duke had plans drawn up for a new town situated half a mile away, next to the lochside. The plans 
were to gather dust for almost 30 years. In 1770, Scotland's first new town began to take shape. Nearly two and a half centuries later, the bond between the castle and the town is as strong as ever. I think it's very important. It gives the it gives Inverira a name, a well-known name. The clan Campbell's the largest clan, and it has worldwide recognition. So it's, it's it's very good for the town. The castle is a great great attraction. It's beautifully maintained, and we we have we have lots and lots of visitors, especially coming for the to see the, the attractions of the castle. Oh, they're a fine young couple. It's good to see them around the town. And uh, I mean, I've known Turpo since he was a baby. And Eleanor I've got to know since the marriage. And oh, he's a fine young lad. Ah, good people, yeah, indeed. Yeah. I mean, we need something like that about the place anyway. I mean, it's just, this is what it is, it's Campbell country. Yeah. I mean, he tentatively tried to nip in before he was 18 for a fly one, but... Uh, uh, we'd, he discreetly got one and then chased home before father, father was on the phone. But uh, yes, no, they're a nice young family. They might have came in for a few supper, but they sent someone to get it for them. Uh, I've not met them personally. My children have met them personally. Uh, lovely people. We have a Christmas party just before Christmas and we have the whole of the primary school. So we have 80 kids and my children and I make 80 jellies, 80 cupcakes, 80 rounds of sandwiches, 80, you know, little crispy things with chocolate on. And uh, it's a great way of everyone getting together, getting to know each other and then hopefully getting rid of that perception that, you know, the people up on the hill are all, you know, shut away doing their own thing. We're all part of it. So it's a tourist town. You know, we want tourists to come in from... We'd rather they came to Scotland than they went to Lanzarote. So, you know, it's all to do with the whole town. Everyone works together, everyone has fun. We employ lots of people, but hopefully it's a question of us all pulling together to make, you know, a lovely day out for a tourist who's come to Inverera. We are, we are a team and, uh, you know, the two of us uh, run the castle. My wife, uh, you know, she runs the, the shop, she runs the tea room, she runs the sort of the PR side of it, the website. Uh, she comes from a media background. So I think, you know, we've both got our strengths, I think, which makes it, a, uh, makes it a very strong team. And, you know, she's, dare I say, relatively new to the job. You know, she's been doing it now for 10 years. Um, but, you know, she's, she's great at it, and I couldn't do it without her. And I couldn't do it without the support that she gives me for what I do. We've got um, you know, one coach has just turned up. We've got, I think, another seven or eight to turn up today. So 360 uh, Americans off a cruise ship. Uh, sun shining, it's beautiful, blue sky. This is Argyle at its finest. Just magical. Nice start. Well, I've come a long ways to find family history. Oh, right. So you're Campbell, are you? Uh, yeah, my mother was. Thank well, you very I'm, much. I'm, and... I'm the clan chief. Oh, yeah, well, nice I'm... to meet you. Oh, my goodness, the Duke. <laughs> If we're busy, he's straight down, or if, you know, I need a help, I, her grace comes down as well. She also helps in other parts of the castle if we need them. Well, I think it's, it's, it's a family home, isn't it? And they want to see it, you know, as I keep saying, we're not a museum. We have got historical things. You can trace Campbell history back till 1200 and something here. But at the end of the day, it's a family home and we run the shop. And it's, I think it makes for a better day out for everyone. So whether it's off-putting or not to have us here, we, we are here. And it's, you know, it's our shop and we want people to have the best time in it. There's not many castles you can come along where you find a duke signing books in the shop wearing his kilt and a duke apron. I guess. <laughs> so those, those are our souvenir books. They're all signed by his grace. Written by my wife and graffitied by me. <laughs> OK. <laughs> the ladies are really delighted to see him when they come down. They love to have their photograph taken. And he signs everything or, you know, whatever they want signed. I mean, all the, all the souvenir books that, that we send out all go out with my own personal signature on it. Uh, people say, why don't I print it on? But that's just, that's not truly authentic. And if you want to see one being signed, just to make sure it's truly authentic. Would you like to sign it? There's one that you saw signed. Thank you. We've got a range of whiskies here. Fan Campbell blended scotch, uh, which obviously has the family name on it. And again, all the little bottles go out uh, with my signature on it.
Every year, the castle hosts thousands of cruise ship visitors who come by coach from the west coast town of Oban. Today is a special day for Torquil, and a coachload of American tourists have a surprise for the Duke. <laughs> party people I hate surprises <laughs> thank you very much that's very very kind of you very sweet um, and it's been a great pleasure to have you all here today I hope you've enjoyed your visit yes. and I hope you all take back happy memories of how wonderful Argyle is how the Sun always shines here <laughs> um, and what a magical place we've got and as I said it's been a great pleasure to have you, so what did you get for your birthday? Um, I got a very nice picture <laughs> wonderful oh well then there we go. So My pleasure. My pleasure. Bye bye. Visitors are very important. And, you know, when we talk about the responsibility, um, being open to the public is, to me, a very important part of it. Because a lot of people come here to trace their heritage, to trace their roots, to appreciate, you know, what I think we do very well in Scotland, which is sort of ancestry, castles, whiskey. Um, that is important to me. The Duke has arrived for his daily meeting with castle manager Jane Young. On today's agenda are a whiskey tasting and a music recital for 12 VIP guests from France. Right, so we have these VIPs coming off the Royal Scotsman this evening. Quarter to six, I think. Quarter to six, I think that's about right. Mm -hmm. So we just need to make sure that everything's cleaned up when the castle closes. So we'll start in the, in the hall for drinks reception. Mm -hmm. Then they'll move in to the saloon. So we've got the opera singer and the pianist coming yes. over from Paris. Yep. Uh, and then after that, they are gonna go through to the state dining room mm -hmm. and I'll take them through. Okay. Uh, so in there, we have got the whiskey tasting. So the table needs to be cleared. Yeah, move back into the middle of the room, tablecloth. And I will do a half an hour tour of the castle. There can't be many of Scotland's great estates where the report of a fallen tree sees the estate owner himself taking to the hills. Armed with a chainsaw, a tree is blocking the access road to the hilltop folly that is Dunnyquake. No sooner does he hear about the problem than the Duke sets off. So far as he's concerned, it's just another job he has to take care of. Well, if the road's blocked, all in a day's work, you've got to sort the problem out yourself. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, there's a lot of trees around here, a lot of wind, and uh, oh, when you come across something, it's much easier to sort it out yourself than to go and find somebody else to do it. So we will just get rid of this tree and then we can carry on on our way. Part of the job. He loves fishing, he loves chainsawing, he loves meeting people. He's a, I think this is his paradise, this place. We're on top of Donny Quake, which is the hill that overlooks the castle with the folly. And you know, it's just beautiful. I mean, I think today's one of those days when definitely pictures speak louder than words. I mean, we've got about 60,000 acres here. I mean, more of it sort of uh, that direction, that direction, and that direction. When you're up here and you've got a place like this, you, know, you need to enjoy it as well. I mean, we all work hard. I mean, as you've seen, you know, what we do here is, it's not just a coincidence. I mean, we have to work very, very hard at it uh, to keep everyone happy and make them excited, make them want to come and visit Argyle. We're very, very lucky. You know, the staff here are fantastic and I think, you know, they appreciate what we do and we really appreciate what they do and the way that they help us. And, you know, people love this part of the world. It was, you know, the peace and quiet, the tranquility is wonderful. 
Uh, and then of course tourism is a very important part of what we do. Uh, so that's the tourist season during the summer months. And then, you know, come the end of October, things quiet down again and everyone get on doing other things. I think for a lot of people, I mean, you might sort of grow up here, you might, you know, go off and, and live in Edinburgh or Glasgow or London or whatever, but I think, generally speaking, people tend to come back. And, you know, I mean, if this is in your blood, it's very difficult to get it out. Local girl Louise Bell grew up in the town of Inverara and has spent the last few summers working at the castle. I still love it every time I come home from uni, like coming over the bus on the bridge, I still love seeing it. I remember coming around when I was a wee girl though and getting scared by some of the rooms and thinking there was ghosts and things in it. And I've worked in the team for a few years now since like, when I was at school and stuff, just weekend work in this. It's like a family, because like, I've known everyone here for years now and everyone's just so close and you can just tell them everything and you don't feel, like, a lot of places you work, you feel kind of distant from other people, but you feel really close to everyone. Well, it's very nice working here at the castle because although it's a historic building, there's a relaxed family atmosphere and it's got the feel of a family home. It's nice to see the three young children enjoying the castle and, and just romping in the grounds and so on. Louise and Stafford are used to their workplace being busy, but today is going to be especially demanding. One, two. The family is opening up their home to more than 20,000 visitors from all over Britain, here to attend the Duchess's new passion, the Best of the West Festival. So far the sun has been shining and people have been coming through the door. I'm always nervous of being too optimistic, but I think hopefully it's looking pretty good today. We've got actually a much bigger area this year, so the music tent's twice as big. Food and the drink, it's all been laid out, so there's a lot more space. Which is great, and people seem to be filling it. In terms of its status among the nation's aristocratic families, the social standing of the Campbells rose sharply in the 1870s when Queen Victoria's daughter, Princess Louise, married the Marquis of Lorn, son of the 8th Duke of Argyll. When Victoria visited the castle in 1874, a special entrance canopy was designed for her by Sir Matthew Digby Wyatt at the entrance of the castle. It has since become known as Paddington Station, because of the similarities to its London namesake. The ninth Duke's wife, Princess Louise, has a room in the castle created in her honour. So, you know, within the room here, we've got lots of pictures of her and lots of things that she sculpted. She was a great artist. Now, here's a, a sculpture of uh, Queen Victoria uh, that she did, but probably her most famous uh, sculpture of Queen Victoria is outside Kensington Palace in London. Uh, she came here on a couple of occasions uh, and, you know, one of the reasons that we have Paddington Station uh, out the front of the castle uh, was so that Queen Victoria could get out of her carriage uh, and not get wet as she came into the castle. Because sometimes it rains in Argyll, but not very often. When she married the Marquis of Lorn, he became the fourth Governor-General of Canada. Uh, and, of course, she went off to Canada with him. And, you know, there are sketchbooks in the archives uh, that are pictures that she probably did on her travels around Canada. And, I mean, they're absolutely stunning. She was a very, very talented artist. Her many paintings, along with maps and documents going back centuries, are housed in the old estate stables, now home to the Argyle Archive. We've actually brought out some of her sketchbooks, uh, and these are sketches and watercolours done by Princess Louise. Uh, we have a lot from Canada, but I've actually dug out some that are local ones, local views. We have, you know, pictures here from Crean Larrach, uh, up in the, the, the Scottish Alps, as we like to call them. Uh, and also some amazing pictures of Loch Awe, which is where the family actually came from. And, of course, Kruachan, 
Ben Kruchen is on Lahore, and Kruchen is the battle cry of the Campbells, so a very symbolic uh, hill for, for Campbell people. Um, but they really are stunning. She was a very, very talented artist, and obviously quite a prolific one. This is one of the biggest and best collections of family archives in private hands in existence. And, you know, some of the oldest documents date back to the 11th century. And they go all the way up to the modern day. You've got sort of ledgers, you've got accounts, and you've got title deeds here. You've got plans, you've got pictures, drawings, diaries. I mean, all forms of archives. We were talking to, you know, Andrew this morning, and he is today my factor. So that's really the land manager. Uh, but in my father's generation and before, they were known as the Chamberlains. So in here you've got a whole lot of uh, Chamberlains files and letter files and things that they would have written. And you'll con you can see that the plans... Were Ishbel the McKinnon is the archivist tasked with cataloguing the Argyle archive. Map. Um, this is a map of Tyree. Um, the Dukes of Argyle were great landscape improvers. Um, and they employed um, landscape surveyors to go out and map their land um, and look at ways that it was being um, or organised. And so they created maps like this, which basically are the earliest depictions of the Scottish landscape. Our family house is the old factor's house, which is actually down on this, this little loch down here. But it's an amazing place. I mean, it's like the Caribbean. It's the Caribbean of Scotland. I mean, the, the water is at that amazing Caribbean blue the beaches are miles and miles. I mean, all these are huge, white, sandy beaches. And, you know, you can walk along a beach that's two or three miles long and you don't see another soul. I mean, it's incredible. That's actually where the present-day airfield is. Uh, the island played a very, very important role during the Second World War. And the Royal Air Force went out there and they built a series of triangulated runways. Uh, and planes used to fly out protecting the convoys going across the Atlantic and also doing uh, hunting U-boats. Uh, but probably the most important role that it played is they sent um, weather planes out to try and find a weather window of opportunity uh, for the Normandy and D-Day landings. This wonderful historical archive could so easily have been lost to the nation one terrible night on the 5th of November 1975 when fire ravaged the castle. I was here with my mother, it was mid-afternoon, and the local town bonfire was in a field just, just at the bottom of the garden. Uh, and I do remember being taken off there once the fire had started in the castle. And there I was standing watching the bonfire but nobody else was watching the bonfire. They were all watching the castle burn down. And that, to me, is a, something that I will never, ever forget. Someone said there was a fire in the castle and the local retained fire brigade went up. And I took a drive over to the bridge and saw the flames just starting to burst through the turret nearest the town. And I thought, oh, this is serious then. 1975, living in a rural community, the fire brigade wasn't quite as sophisticated as it is today. And they didn't have their pages and bleepers and everything. It was word of mouth and telephone calls. So actually the people from the village got up here much quicker than any of the fire engines did. And they helped remove you know, the valuable pieces from it as quickly as possible. It was like a mob going through a French chateau during the French Revolution. They were you know, removing everything. We were taking things down off the wall. The wonderful memorial display out display cabinets, elbows were put through, the artifacts lifted, and the water was running down the walls. We were getting kicks of electricity pulling the Rayburns, those lovely portraits in the saloon. I mean, they were getting blankets and tarpaulins and just scooping the books and row after row into these and then just rushing out, flinging them into cars, vans. The estate tractor was there with trailer. And in fact, my wife opened the boot of the car the following evening to find about 50 valuable first edition volumes there. Uh, it was just quite incredible to watch. Uh, and they reckon that they didn't lose one single piece, which says a lot for the honesty of the population. And uh, it was a credit to the town. If it wasn't for their help, uh, you know, we wouldn't have what we have on show today. So. I mean, as a family, we, ho we owe a you know, huge debt of gratitude to, to the locals uh, and the way they helped us preserve 
uh, you know, the great history of the family. About two years later, we had a serious, quite a serious fire, and uh, lo and behold, when we were friends, were down helping and such like, and up turned uh, a Mr and Mrs Campbell, well, the Duke and Duchess, and they rolled up the sleeves and gave us a hand, and they both said, no, you were very good and your family at the time of the fire, so that was very appreciated, and it says a lot for the family. They were, you know, they're straightforward, decent folk. And it wasn't until the next morning that a member of my staff said to me, he'd be up at the castle last night. I said, why? He wished he'd had a terrible fire. But as we went over the bridge out towards Glasgow to catch a plane, they, I noticed a very smoke begrimed flag still flying from the flagpole, you know, almost defiantly. The funds weren't there within the estate or within the insurance to restore it to the condition it had been beforehand. And uh, my parents worked incredibly hard uh, going out to the worldwide Clan Campbell members uh, to raise funds. And it took the best part of five years to get the roof back on and to restore it to a condition that was acceptable to then reopen to the public. Did very well, actually. He made a great job of rescuing the castle from, as he said to me one day himself, you know, I could have taken an insurance money and just walked away from this and built myself a very handsome little house here in my own ground somewhere and live very comfortably ever after. But it's not the way I was brought up. It's as simple as that. The fire may have laid waste to large parts of the historic castle, but it takes a bit more than an inferno and a few thousand gallons of water to shift the Inverera ghosts. And the castle has more than its fair share. There's the Loch Fine ghost ship, said to resemble the ship that features on the Campbell coat of arms. And its sighting is said to be an omen that the chief of the clan Campbell is soon to die. And let's not forget the phantom harpies. We have uh, five ghosts in the castle, but we're in the MacArthur room. Uh, and this is probably the room that has the, 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 the greatest sort of aura around it. And, you know, people walk into this room and they leave it straight away. Uh, and the reason that they do is because of this bed. The ninth Earl uh, was in residence in the castle at the time, and the uh, Marquis of Montrose was in the process of attacking and ransacking the village of Inverara. Uh, the ninth Earl fled by boat onto the loch, uh, but he left behind one of his musicians, a young harpist. Uh, now, with Montrose were a bunch of Irish mercenaries, uh, and the harpist was Irish. And these mercenaries were so incensed that Irish, an Irish boy could work for the House of Campbell that they hung, drawn and quartered him in this particular bed. Uh, so, very often, the sound of a harpist is heard. To do a job like this, you've really got to love what you do. Uh, it's not like going to you know, work for somebody else in an office. You have got to be absolutely passionate about looking after a castle like this, looking after the business, and really preserving it for future generations. It is hard work, but it's interesting. So you wake up in the morning, and it's, it's never going to be a boring day in this place. So you know, you might have. I don't know, 100 people arriving, you know, for a big lunch, or you might have a cruise ship coming in, or you might have a film crew coming in, or you might have a classic car rally, or you know, literally every single day is different. Or you might have a crisis where everyone's phoned in sick from the tea room, and you know you've got you know, 500 people coming in, and who's going to make the cakes, and who's going to serve the teas? So you just, you know, it's never, never dull around here. I, I, you know, I've worked in other companies before, and I've had bosses, and it's all right to work very hard for other bosses, but when you are the boss and you're handing it over to your own children and their children, then somehow you, I think, probably have the extra energy that you might not have if it was someone else's company, maybe. Mixed in with the family pictures on the piano is a photograph of the Hollywood legend Audrey Hepburn. The portrait hints at another chapter of the castle's colourful history. She shouldn't really be on the top of it, but uh, Marga Varg, Margaret Argyll, was uh, my husband's 
grandfather's third wife and she was a, a real society queen of the day she she knew all the best people she had the best parties she was she was quite infamous she had plenty of scandals around her but but uh, the big thing was she had lots of famous people who would she would surround herself with and Lerner and Lowe came to stay here in in Vera Castle and they wrote some of the music for my fair lady at this piano with friends milling around we have a, a concert for some important guests coming and we're going to have an opera singer from Paris and they're going to uh, be serenaded with songs from My Fair Lady. It's really exciting. It's actually a show that I did in Paris a couple of years ago and we'll be doing again in December. So it's a show that I love and really exciting for me to, to be able to perform excerpts of it here on the actual piano. He seems so down to earth. I wasn't sure if he, he was kidding that he's the Duke or he's really the Duke. <laughs> As the last of the visitors depart the castle, preparations begin for another bespoke event, this one featuring VIP guests from France and the very special entertainment being laid on for them. There are 45 minutes to get ready for the evening visitors. As opera singer Eliza Doughty begins rehearsals, the Duke, the Duchess and their staff get the rooms ready for the recital of My Fair Lady and the specially arranged exclusive whiskey tasting. Chivas Brothers master blender, Colin Scott, has arrived at the castle to take charge of the whiskey tasting. It's my home. I don't see it as my place in Scotland. This is my home. This is where I was born and bred. Uh, this is where my roots are. Uh, and that's what I'd like to instill into to my children as well. I think children are so adaptable. So they come here and one half, oh, I say, please don't talk to strangers, please don't talk to strangers. But actually, if they're tourists, please do talk to strangers. Please, you know, look people in the eye. So I think they realize that half their life is different. And I think they realize that this house is bigger than their friends' houses. My nine-year-old in the car yesterday was saying, how am I going to remember how to do everything? How am I going to remember, you know, what I'm meant to do in this night? I said, well, you, you know, you'll learn and hopefully you'll get a good wife or someone to help you. Or, you know, maybe he should go and work in a very big bank and get someone else to do it or, you know, whatever he's, his skill is at the time. But, but I think children are amazing. I think they, they just get on with it. And, and our eldest son knows one day that he will be the Duke, but I don't think he's thought it through probably much further than that. He's only nine. To me, it is more than worth keeping. It's something that, you know, it's, this, it's amazing history. I mean, you're sitting in, in Inverara Castle, which is the seat of the chiefs of Clan Campbell, which have been, over the years, one of the most powerful families in Scotland. And I think, you know, when you look at the amount of people that we welcome through our doors each summer, uh, and, you know, you read their comments or their letters and their experiences from coming here, uh, you know, it is a very important place. Its history stretches back almost three centuries 
to when the 5th Earl of Dumfries commissioned a stately home to be built. Its design came from one of Britain's most famous architectural families. He wanted to create a kind of honey trap to attract a new wife. If we hadn't stepped in, and then all this wonderful furniture would have literally gone everywhere and we would have been left with a, I think, a completely empty shell of a house. Great Estate Scotland was made possible in part by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. To learn more about Great Estates, visit pbs.org. Great Estates of Scotland is available on DVD. To order, visit shoppbs.org or call 1-800-PLAY-PBS. Its terrain covers more than 60,000 glorious acres of Western Scotland and includes large parts of the ruggedly beautiful island of Tyree. For centuries, its grand seat, Inverara Castle, has housed the chieftain of one of the world's best-known family clans, the Clan Campbell. For more than 500 years, the castle has stood proud on the western shore of Loch Fyne, Scotland's longest saltwater sea log. It is now the home to the 13th Duke of Argyle, His Grace Torquil Ian Campbell. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm the clan chief. Oh, well, nice um, to meet you. Oh, my goodness, the Duke. <laughs> His wife, Eleanor, whose family owned the Cadbury's chocolate empire. Hello, how do you do? I'm Eleanor, how do you do? And their three children. Running an estate of this size in the 21st century is a far cry from times gone by. It's been good. It's been very busy, hasn't it? We had the cruise ships, we had lots of tourists. It's been busy. And, of course, a large amount of Campbells as well. It represents a daily challenge for a young couple who work around the clock to maintain a proud tradition that stretches back for centuries. Actually taking this place on was just something that I'd prepared myself for all my life. And yet, the Grand Fortress so very nearly came to a premature end when calamitous misfortune struck in 1975. I was here with my mother, it was mid-afternoon, and there I was standing watching the bonfire. But nobody else is watching the bonfire, they're all watching the castle burn down. And that, to me, is a, something that I will never, ever forget. The shore of beautiful Loch Fyne has hosted an Inverara castle since the 15th century. The castle that is today the spiritual home to Campbells across the globe took 43 years to build. The present Duke and his family occupy two floors. The rest of the castle is open to paying customers, many of them Campbells from all over the world, who come to see how the clan chieftains of one of Scotland's most powerful families once lived and how the present chieftain lives now. Over a checkered history straddling hundreds of years, Campbells have led the nation and have fought and died in both sides of attritional wars. Today, weapons used in these wars adorn the walls of the castle's great hall. Under the tallest ceiling in Scotland are over 1,800 examples of arms, and armory through the ages. Halberds, pistols, shields, and muskets. My mother was very keen on black powder muzzle firing weapons, and uh, we actually restored quite a few of them to firing order, and we used to fire them as, as uh, and, you know, younger children, which was quite impressive, because you, know, you pull the trigger and there's a sort of big puff of smoke and then a bang, and, and it off goes the musket ball. But um, as children, we used to sit there in the evenings and, and melt lead and pour them in and make musket balls here. 
I come from a good Quaker family, so actually we don't even... Uh, when, whenever there's been a war, then we've been the ones driving the ambulances or, or that kind of thing. So actually not even soldiers, not a family of soldiers at all. The family traditionally supported the, the British Crown, uh, but the eighth Earl uh, fell out of favour with King Charles I. Uh, he was a very strong Presbyterian and he lost his head. Uh, then his son, the ninth Earl, restored the good name of the family. Uh, but he fell out of favour with uh, King James VII, and he lost his head as well. Now, we have here, in this particular showcase, the Bible that he had in his prison cell the night before he was executed. And what makes it particularly gory is he's actually marked the Bible in his own personal blood uh, of the various chapters he wanted people to read. He was beheaded uh, in Edinburgh. In Its terrain covers more than 60,000 glorious acres of Western Scotland and includes large parts of the ruggedly beautiful island of Tyree. For centuries, its grand seat, Inverara Castle, has housed the chieftain of one of the world's best-known family clans, the Clan Campbell. For more than 500 years, the castle has stood proud on the western shore of Loch Fyne, Scotland's longest saltwater sea log. It is now the home to the 13th Duke of Argyll, His Grace Torquil Ian Campbell. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm the clan chief. Oh, well, yeah. nice to meet you. Oh, my goodness, the Duke. <laughs> His wife, Eleanor, whose family owned the Cadbury's chocolate empire. Hello, how do you do? I'm Eleanor. How do you do? <laughs> and their three children. Running an estate of this size in the 21st century is a far cry from times gone by. It's been good. It's been very busy, hasn't it? She had the cruise ships, we had lots of tourists. It's been busy. And, of course, a large amount of Campbells as well. It represents a daily challenge for a young couple who work around the clock to maintain a proud tradition that stretches back for centuries. Actually taking this place on was just something that I'd prepared myself for all my life. And yet, the Grand Fortress so very nearly came to a premature end when calamitous misfortune struck in 1975. I was here with my mother, it was mid-afternoon, and there I was standing watching the bonfire. But nobody else is watching the bonfire, they're all watching the castle burn down. And that, to me, is a, something that I will never, ever forget. The shore of beautiful Loch Fyne has hosted an Inverara castle since the 15th century. The castle that is today the spiritual home to Campbells across the globe took 43 years to build. The present Duke and his family occupy two floors. The rest of the castle is open to paying customers, many of them Campbells from all over the world, who come to see how the clan chieftains of one of Scotland's most powerful families once lived and how the present chieftain lives now. Over a checkered history straddling hundreds of years, Campbells have led the nation and have fought and died in both sides of attritional wars. Today, weapons used in these wars adorn the walls of the castle's great hall. Under the tallest ceiling in Scotland are over 1,800 examples of arms, and armory through the ages. Halberds, pistols, shields, and muskets. My mother was very keen on black powder muzzle firing weapons. And uh, we actually restored quite a few of them to firing order. And we used to fire them as, as uh, and, you know, younger children, which is quite impressive because, you know, you pull the trigger and there's a sort of big puff of smoke and then a bang and, and it off goes the musket ball. But um, as children, we used to sit there in the evenings and, and melt lead and pour them in and make the musket balls here. I come from a good Quaker family, so actually we don't even... Uh, when, whenever there's been a war, then we've been the ones driving the ambulances or, or that kind of thing. So actually not even soldiers, not a family of soldiers at all. The family traditionally supported the, the British Crown, uh, but the eighth Earl uh, fell out of favour with King Charles I. Uh, he was a very strong Presbyterian and he lost his head. Uh, then his son, the ninth Earl, restored the good name of the family. 
uh, but he fell out of favor with uh, King James VII, and he lost his head as well. Now, we have here, in this particular showcase, the Bible that he had in his prison cell the night before he was executed. And what makes it particularly gory is he's actually marked the Bible in his own personal blood uh, of the various chapters he wanted people to read. He was beheaded uh, in Edinburgh in uh, 1685 by the Maiden, which was the Scottish guillotine. Now, in those days, you know, the Scots were pretty brutal. Uh, with a guillotine, the blade comes down on the back of your head uh, as you're facing down, but with the Maiden, you have to face up and the blade comes down your throat. So you can actually see as it comes down, but uh, I've no intention of being taken by the Maiden. There's two very, uh, very strong traits or genetic traits that run in the family. One is the nose and the other is squint eyes. Uh, and if you look at a couple of the portraits, you see the same thing. And I have to say, I carry on the same trait. <laughs> Didn't put me off, but we've just spent a lot of time having the elder son's eyes done because the teacher at school said, did you realise we think he might have slightly squint eyes? Yes. So yes, a lot of testing goes on, but these days it's quite fixable, luckily. The first stone of what was to become the fabulous Inverara Castle was laid in 1746. Even as the dying fires of the Jacobite rebellions were finally snuffed out at the Battle of Culloden. This new era in Scottish history meant that for the first time, Scottish castles were being designed, not as fearsome fortresses, but as showcases of their owners' extravagant wealth and hospitality. In its heyday, Inverara Castle employed over 60 servants. Today, there are four full-time employees and 21 part-time staff members. Being a duke is an hereditary title that is passed down from father to son. But how exactly does one become a duchess? I was a friend of Torquil's sisters. I was in the car with Louise, my now sister-in-law, and we were driving past, and I said, wow, look at that, look at that out the window. And she said, that's where we're going. And I could sort of hear my mother's voice in the back of my head going, you should have done your search, you should have you realised who you're going to stay with, and I just thought I was going to stay with Louise. I met Torko when I was 19, and very glad I didn't marry him then. So 13 years later, we finally got married. And this is my wedding dress, which uh, I wore on the 8th of June, 11 years ago. Uh, it was designed by Bruce Oldfield, and it was amazing it was a uh, it was stunning it was a very beautiful coat for the day and then in the evening the coat came off and there was a very elegant party dress underneath so i was a lucky girl poor dad <laughs> i never assumed i'd marry anyone in particular and was a little surprised myself when i ended up with this place to look after today all hands are on deck as the duke and duchess are expecting over a thousand visitors to the castle over the years the castle has played backdrop to events as varied as they are numerous. Today is the turn of the International Vintage Automobile Club. Members pay up to £2,000 to take part in the rally. This year, the tour takes in Scotland. And today's much-anticipated stop is at Inverara Castle, where they are to be greeted personally by the Duke of Argyll. Well, and the Duke. 